Who am I? Let's pre spy. I'm a graduate student in um, Leymore Joshua's tour lab at Coltsmore Harbor Laboratory. And this is where I work. Although lately I've been working from home some because I'm analyzing a bunch of data I got and preparing uh, my thesis because I am, fingers crossed, graduating uh, or yeah, and defending my thesis and graduating in October. So I'm really excited um, and I just wanted to tell you a little bit more about myself and what I try to do through um, the bumbling biochemist. Um, so yeah, lab coat cape. Um, all that good stuff. So let's take a look. So that's where I am now. But where'd I come from? I was born and raised in California, where I went to St. Mary's College um, for my undergraduate um, education, and I studied general biology. I then decided to move all the way across the country where I had no family, and no friends or anything, uh, to go to grad school at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory, which turned out to be a really good gamble. But I didn't even think that I was going to go to grad school. I didn't even really know grad school was a thing until several years into college. So St. Mary's College is an awesome school, um, but it's a small liberal arts school, and so we didn't even have a science graduate program. So I got involved with research during a summer undergraduate program at, at St. Mary's. And I started doing uh, research with Dr. Jeffrey Sigmund, um, doing some protein biochemistry. And that's where I really got, um, started to fall in love with research. And so it started as the, just that summer. And then I continued on through um, independent study throughout um, the school year. It was really cool because I actually got course credit for doing research, so that was really awesome. Um, but Dr. Singman encouraged me to get some outside research experience as well. So basically, at the time, I was thinking that I was going to, to go to I wanted to go to med school. Um, that's actually one of the reasons why I started doing research was because I wanted to have um, some good things to put on my CV um, for, to, for applying to medical school. But I didn't expect that I would fall in love with research so much. Basically, the reason that one of the main reasons I wanted to go to med school was because I knew I liked science, I knew I liked biology, I knew I liked, wanted to help people, and so it seemed like medical school was the thing to do if you were in that situation like I didn't know there was this alternate path where you could actually like be a scientist so and the way that I really got exposed to this larger science um, scientific experience um, and was getting some outside research experience so I did a summer research program um, with the, through a fellowship um, from the Huntington's Disease Society of America. Um, so I did some research with uh, Dr. Stephen Finkbeiner at um, UCSF and the Gladstone Institutes. So there I got to talk with grad students, um, postdocs, which are like postdoctoral researchers that are doing more research after they finish, they graduate, um, like in a different lab. And I really decided like, I really, really like this research, and so I was thinking, okay, maybe I'll do an MD-PhD program. But then the more I thought about it, I didn't think that I would use the MD that much, so why go for it? Like, So I thought, like, research is for me, so I decided to apply um, to PhD programs, and I was fell in love with Cold Spring Harbor um, the first I got of it um, I actually got snowed in my interview weekend so I got a little extra time and it was really amazing um, and I was lucky that they chose me and I haven't looked back since um, so one of the things of grad school you have to do is choose a lab 
So the way it works in different programs varies, but for um, most biomedical science programs, the w you apply to a program instead of applying to a specific lab. And then once you get into the program, you do lab rotation. So you basically try out several different labs before choosing one. Um, and I chose to join Limor Joshua Tours Lab. Um, and it's a structural biology and biochemistry lab. So structural biology is basically where we try to figure out what molecules, like proteins and um, DNA, RNA, um, complexes, those sort of things, what they look like and how what they look like um, affects how they function and how that they function affects what they look like. So I like to think of the example of a pocket knife, how if you see a pocket knife, um, like a Swiss Army knife and all those different parts, you can tell what those different parts will do. And then if you make changes to those parts, it'll affect the function. So you can go back and forth between form and function. The lab has a couple main focuses. So one of them is DNA replication. So basically how DNA copies itself before it divides so that each cell gets a, a copy. I don't deal with that side of things. Instead, I'm involved with this um, non-coding RNAi side of the lab. So just a brief overview of RNAi. I gave a longer talk on this um, last week that you can check out and I'll provide the link to. But basically RNA interference or RNAi is an evolutionarily conserved mechanism of post-transcriptional gene regulation. So basically you have a gene that's written in DNA an RNA copy of that gets made called messenger RNA um, and then that gets used by protein making complexes called ribosomes to make proteins um, which are made up of amino acids and so the gene to mRNA step is called transcription mRNA to protein is called translation uh, RNA I is post transcription so it's acting on that mRNA um, and as you can imagine, the amount of mRNA affects how much protein you can make. So if you decrease the amount of mRNA, you decrease the amount of protein that's made. And that's what RNAi does, and it does it in this cool sequence-specific manner um, using these small, um, these short RNAs that are about 20 letters long. Um, these small RNAs that include microRNAs and siRNAs. Um, and they get carried by this protein Argonaut, and Argonaut uses these small RNAs as guides to go find messenger RNAs that contain complementary sequences, and then downregulate the um, the amount of mRNA um, and therefore the amount of protein that gets made. So it's it's a really cool way that your cells can regulate how much um, of various proteins get made at a time. So I'm studying how um, this, pro how Argonaut, so that protein, is regulated. Um, and to do this, I take an approach where I like purify and study the various um, proteins and RNAs and that sort of thing. So um, I can get protein using a co something called recombinant protein expression. So basically, I take the gene for a protein I want to study and I stick it into a different piece of DNA, like a circular piece of DNA, like a back, for, uh, called a plasmid that we can stick in bacteria. Except the proteins I study are more tricky, so I have to um, I express them in insect cells, which is a little more complicated but of a process. But basically, I can stick the gene in, the cells will make the protein, and then I just have to purify it out. And so, purifying it out makes a um, is a longer thing that involves making a lot of mess. Um, breaking open those cells, spinning them down to pellet out the cells, um, then using protein chromatography. Um, so putting the protein through various columns full, full of little beads called resin that have different properties um, that separate proteins based on their charge and size and that sort of thing. And then um, SDS page, which is a technique that we can use to just like look at the little bits of it to see if the purification worked and how the protein looks and that sort of thing. Um, and so yeah, we, so we can do this chromatography in like manual columns, so as you'll see in the one at the strep tag and then the um, with an acta, which is like a big machine that we can use. And so basically I'm just mainly showing you this to show you some of the sort of things that I do um, on a day-to-day -day basis and that I teach people about. Um, 
And so in addition, so once to have that pure protein, I can do things like x-ray crystallography where I get the protein cr to form these crystals and then I shoot x-rays at them. And then the x-rays um, get scattered by the protein um, and they form these patterns that I can work back from to get the structure of the protein. So like where all the atoms are located. So a lot of, um, so that's a key structural biology technique. Another one is cryo-electron microscopy, which um, most, basically everyone in my lab except for me does. Um, I did a little crystallography, but most of what I do is biochemistry. So basically trying to figure out how the proteins are working um, rather than what they look like. Um, so that's my main focus is doing things like um, functional assays and binding assays. So like the slop lot where I can have these, um, this like membrane, so I have a membrane on top that'll bind to protein and any bound RNA. And then on the bottom, I have a membrane that'll bind to any free RNA. And so I can use this apparatus to study um, protein RNA binding. Um, and so I have a post on that too. Um, so basically, I'm just trying to give you an overview of the sort of things that I talk about in all these posts. Um, so in addition to having my um, daily 365 Days of Science posts, um, which you can find on my blog, I have a bunch of other stuff on my blog too. So I have um, versions of all my daily posts that you can search through, um, a page with classic experiments, um, a page with protein purification lab techniques. Um, if you go to the Let's Talk Science um, page, you can get links to um, more of these things. Um, I also have um, a woman in science page where I have profiles of lots and lots of women. I used to be a female scientist. I used to be the um, social media chair for Coltsman Harbor Labs um, Women in, in Science and Engineering WISE group. Um, and so I wrote weekly Wise Wednesday profiles of various scientists. So I have like a ton of profiles on lots of awesome female scientists. Um, I also have a, um, a glossary, which you, um, you can find at the top bar. Um, there's a glossary which of D jargon, science jargon. So trying to really um, just take the jargon out and tell you what these terms mean. Um, and you'll also find in the post versions that if you like scroll over some of the words that are like underlined, I'm not, I think they're underlined, um, a box will pop up with if they have a, if they have an entry in the glossary and they'll tell you what it, what that term means and then give you the option to click to go to the glossary page. Um, what else do I have? Um, I have a, yeah, I have a lot of things on there. Um, there's some graphics um, too, so feel free to use those. Um, as long as you cite me, cite um, the Bumbling Biochemist or Breezy Bell, Randy Bell, any of that. Um, and thank you. Um, and yeah, so I'm going to, the, the reason I do all this is just, I don't do it for money. I don't get paid at all, believe me. It's a big, um, it's a lot of work, um, on top of being a full-time PhD student, but I do it because I love helping people learn, and I think that biochemistry is really awesome, and I hate that it's always, like, people seem to be, like, afraid of it, or, which is often because people, like, tell you, like, oh, that's really hard or something, but biochemistry is really really awesome and there are things that can be hard but if you that's why I'm trying to help bridge that gap and so my I've always had this like what my goal career wise is I want to become an undergraduate um, professor at like a small school and have like a little lab where I can give students their first research experiences um, and that sort of thing and I really I have this passion for helping undergrads. So a lot of my content is <clears throat> mainly focused with that um, audience in mind, but I also try to make things um, <clears throat> more accessible for a general audience as, <clears throat> as well. Although I don't expect everyone to be able to follow along with everything. 
I try my best, but I also try to provide a lot of detail because I feel like a lot of things are either overgeneralized for like a public audience um, or they're like so technical, like science articles that you can't understand. So I found that a lot when I was an undergrad where there was not really that middle ground of um, not so dense, but introducing these terminologies, introducing these techniques and these the details that you actually need to be able to really understand and um, do experiments and all of these things, um, but at a level that's, it's not dumbed down, it's just de-jargonized and made more accessible. And so that's kind of my goal throughout um, everything I do. Um, I just really want to help people learn and I have this like log in my brain basically of everything that I was confused about in undergrad um, and all those times that I got embarrassed when I didn't know something um, and so I've kind of tried to be the teacher that I would have wanted no I had awesome teachers don't get me wrong but there were times where I there were things that I didn't understand and I mean I'm sure if I had asked my professors I probably would have understood better um, and I did ask a lot of questions so don't be afraid to ask questions but basically if there's something that I was confused about in undergrad I try to keep that in mind when I make my posts and explain things in the way that I found um, helped me understand the concepts um, so yeah, so that's basically me um, and what I do, and I hope that it can help you, and yeah, that's basically it. Um, so I'm just going to stop rambling now, and thanks for listening and following along, and happy learning.